All right. Um, before I even get started with my main talk, it just occurs to me we have like a couple people, uh, usually from boot camp programs. Um, oh, that's not where I wanted to be. Um, where I wanted to be, um, the launchscout.com website um, should be, I hope, pretty easy to find um, our career section and uh, the developer apprenticeship position. Um, the reason that I'm pointing this one out, uh, if you're um, new to software development, um, maybe you're self-taught or went through a bootcamp program, have learned to code, but are looking to get your first position, um, we actually have an apprenticeship pair likely starting up in the next month or so, and we are actively uh, assessing um, submissions. So uh, if you're interested in the apprenticeship program, uh, that is absolutely the place to go. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have any questions about that, uh, you can hit me up at chris at launchscout.com as well. Um, but the main topic uh, I'm going to be talking about is embedded apps with live state. Um, this is a modification with hopefully more of a JavaScript focus of a talk that I'll be giving at the end of the month at Elixir Comp. Um, and uh, the reason that's relevant here is um, Live State itself is, is a full stack, um, I don't know, set of libraries. Uh, framework's the wrong word because it's not that. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a couple libraries to facilitate building what I call embedded web apps. And uh, let's start with defining that term. So what even is an embedded uh, web application. Um, as you might guess, it's designed to add functionality to a larger application. And there are lots of examples of this kind of thing in the wild, and there have been for a while. Uh, one might be you go to a website and you see like a live support button that pops up a chat widget, something like that. Uh, you might have a site that's mostly static and just has a buy button that has some in, in e commerce interactivity. Um, you might see a comment section of a website. And uh, with, with those things, uh, a lot of the time, and, and this is kind of what we're talking about, um, the med main website itself is not implementing that functionality. Uh, they're using a service to provide live support, to provide e-commerce, to provide comments. Uh, and then uh, they're bringing in that functionality onto their website um, that's provided by this other service. So that's what I mean when I say embedded application. Um, surveys is another one. You know, you might have a website and you want to drop in a SurveyMonkey survey and SurveyMonkey, for example, will give you a thing that you can add to your website um, to, to just give you that survey that will then take you, that will actually, um, the survey itself and stuff is stored over at um, an external service. Um, so <clears throat> how do those things typically work? Um, if you've worked on maintaining a website, um, you kind of know about this. Uh, usually it's what we call third-party JavaScript, um, which doesn't mean a lot by itself. Um, but usually it's like, here, if you want our um, functionality in your website, you just drop in this script tag, and a lot of times it will create a iframe that does some functionality. Um, and, you know, that's been the state of the art for a long time um, and it works. Uh, but I think there are some, some problems with this approach and I think we have better options now. Um, and really the main thing is um, because it's, it's often an iframe, because it's entirely kind of a, a proprietary one-off kind of approach, um, usually the amount of customization you have for that is pretty limited. Uh, it's just going to do what it does. Maybe you can change the colors. Maybe you can't. Maybe you can change some functionality. Maybe you can't. Um, but it's not really well integrated with the rest of your, your website. Um, 
but we have a better option for doing this and uh, it's just I've seen a few examples of it but I would say its use is still uh, in its infancy for this particular um, problem I guess um, and that is uh, custom elements uh, of course Brian Fulte you correctly guessed uh, I'm going to talk about some custom elements uh, also known as web components uh, because that's kind of what I'm into um, custom elements um, at this point um, we've kind of been seeing them come along for a few years but at this point they are well supported in all the browsers um, when I'm talking about custom elements I'm talking about custom HTML elements uh, that you can provide and uh, and then add into your website just like any other HTML elements uh, and the nice thing about them, uh, not only are they fully integrated with your website because they're just HTML elements in the DOM like any other HTML element, uh, that means they can also participate in CSS styling. Um, the way that you actually provide the ability to style the internal structure of your um, custom element um, that uses something called CSS shadow parts. Uh, which we'll, I think, look at briefly if there's time. Um, so uh, in my mind, custom elements, if you're trying to provide functionality to add to a website, like a uh, comment section or a survey or something like that, providing a custom HTML element that a uh, user of your service can then just add to their website to me, uh, I'm, I'm here to make the case that that's the right tool for the job. So um, what's live state? Uh, live state is an approach for making embeddable applications, uh, specifically as custom elements is the examples I'm gonna show you all. Uh, live state itself uh, has nothing to do with custom elements. Uh, it just makes working with them easy. Uh, live state is really, though, the, the idea is um, it consists of an Elixir library, which I won't talk about as much. Um, it also con consists of a JavaScript library, which we'll go into more detail on. Um, the library itself, the NPM, is called phx-live-state, um, and uh, it's not an official part of Phoenix, which is an Elixir framework. Uh, I just borrowed that prefix because uh, live state was taken. Hey, Chris. Um, yeah. Before you keep going, we just had a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, asking about the comparison of custom components or web components to things like JSX React components. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone also was asking how similar those custom components that you create are to custom elements. Would you mind touching on those really quick? Uh, yes, so I am talking about custom elements. So um, the, uh, the W3 spec for building a custom HTML element, that's what I'm talking about when I say uh, custom elements. And so those are different than React components in that uh, React components are proprietary to React. You can take a React component, you can use it in a React app, but if you want to use it in the view app uh, you have to wrap it with something if you want to use it in an angular app or if you want to use it in uh, a website you have to um, tell react where to render it uh, it's um, a react components only work with react whereas a custom html element is is an html element in the same way that if you add a div tag to your markup that is an html element it's that same level of integration. It's a full part of the DOM. It's a DOM element uh, rendered by your browser. Um, so it's it's the difference between like uh, a proprietary model, which React takes, versus uh, actually following the specs. Um, hopefully that answers the questions. Um, Anyway, you can let me know if it doesn't. Oh, I see some chats going on. Let's see. Okay, got it. Yep. Cool, cool. Um, so the basic ideas, uh, what am I doing with the live state? Um, so the basic ideas of live state centered around events. 
Oops, let me see if I can get back here. Events and state. Uh, and then the third thing that we're going to look at are, um, and these actually live on the server. So we want, won't actually look at them as much, but I'll, I'll just show you some examples. Uh, reducers. Uh, reducers are functions which take an event, the current state, and then the return a new state. So at the core of the live state, we're talking about um, subscribing to state, as in the state is managed on the server and broadcast to the client. And we're talking about events, uh, which are in our case, just gonna be custom events, uh, custom DOM events. Uh, and those things uh, are what we work with on the live state side. And um, on the server side, we have reducers, which uh, take an event, take a current state and return a new state. And so this pattern of events and state and reducers, uh, not a new idea at all. Um, in JavaScript land, of course, this sounds an awful lot like Redux. Um, but it also appears in things like Ember.js. Uh, over on the server side, we have a lot more examples of this pattern. Um, and it really kind of is a design pattern for managing state in a functional um, programming environment. And uh, really, uh, I can't find a name for this pattern yet, which is interesting to me, you know. Could we call it event state reducers? Uh, maybe we could call it an event-driven thingamajig. Action-oriented stuff. I don't know, I'm just making up names here. Um, but my point is, um, it's not a new idea. It's a design pattern that is kind of well-established at this point. And the only new-ish idea in live state is really taking this pattern multi-tier. So typically this pattern is implemented entirely on the client side or entirely on the server side. And what I'm talking about is spanning those tiers. Uh, and what that means as a developer is instead of having to deal with requests and responses and then deciding what to do and how to keep your client state in sync with the server, uh, you dispatch events and you receive state. So it gets hopefully a lot simpler. Uh, you can optionally also um, receive other events as part of a reply. I'm getting some background noise from somebody. Um, and uh, so let's dive into how it works just in a little bit more detail. Um, so what we're doing, what the Live State Library is actually doing under the covers, it's connecting to a backend server over WebSockets. Uh, it's using something called Phoenix Channels. Uh, it's kind of an abstraction layer to, um, to provide those, uh, the, that WebSocket uh, connectivity. And um, when you actually use Live State, and we'll see some code here very shortly, um, when you make your connection, you receive initial state, and then you also receive any subsequent updates to state. Uh, you also have the ability to dispatch custom events, which are then translated into WebSocket and then sent over to the server for processing. Um, optionally, the server can also send new events as, as a reply when you send an event up. So this is all brought to you by the uh, PHX Live State MPM. Uh, it's a JavaScript NPM, um, and live state is kind of the lower level API for working with it. Uh, you construct a live state instance, which I'll show you how that works. Um, we also have a higher level uh, of API, which is a little bit nicer to deal with. Um, and this is where we actually start getting to custom elements. We have a connect element function which allows you to wire up a custom element to a live state instance. And we may have even more uh, ergonomics in terms of a nicer to deal with API in the future. Um, that's kind of TBD. For now, connect element seems to work pretty well. 
So the way you work with the lower level API, like I said, um, the first thing you do is you'll construct a live state instance with new live state, and that gets two arguments, a URL to connect to. So where does your server live? And then the name of a channel, um, which is um, kind of arbitrary and it's defined on the server side. Uh, you then call connect once you have your instance uh, and you have some parameters that we'll send over when it makes the connection. Um, that's optional. You don't always need params. Uh, and then one the other one of the other functions that you have is subscribe. Um, subscribe is a function that takes a function. The function that you pass into subscribe, is the handler function for any state changes. So you are subscribing to state and that function that you pass will get called with the new state anytime there's a new state to be had. The other side of it is there's a push event uh, function on live state which expects to receive a custom event. If you haven't seen custom events, um, they're standard built into your browser um, and they've been around for quite some time. And they don't get a lot of press necessarily, but they're easy to work with. Basically, they let you just define your own event. An event has a name and it has an object. One of those objects uh, or one of those properties of that object is a detail property. That detail is entirely up to you what to put in there and that for our purposes is considered the payload of the event and we'll see that in action uh here shortly um up on the server side when you call push event um there's a handle event um that's called over on the server side we won't spend too much time looking at that i'll maybe touch on it briefly but because that's in the elixir code less relevant to this group so uh, I mentioned that there's a higher level of abstraction, and this is a little bit more convenient to work with. So this is uh, this is probably what we'll show in our example here in just a few. Um, connect element uh, takes an element, a live state instance, and some options. And in those options, we have properties, which are a list of properties of the element that you want bound to the state. We can also have attributes that are also uh, bound to the state, meaning anytime that the state changes, uh, the same, the similar, the same named properties or attributes will change. Um, we also have an events property and events can be events that the element can send, meaning if you dispatch, if an element dispatches this type, this an event named uh, in this list, it will get sent up to live state. Uh, it also has an event that can uh, it can expect to receive, and that means if it's if that event is sent from live state, it will then be then dispatched on this element. So, hey Chris, um, I'm going to start with. Go ahead. Someone was asking um, about. Some more background on channels. I don't know if that's something you can really go into much more detail right now, but um, if uh, not, maybe I, there's a resource you can suggest. I will do that as part of this example that we're going into now. Okay. Um, channels is um, in uh, Elixir code, so it's not JavaScript, but we'll see what it looks like um, here really soon. Um, I would say for like more information, if you really want to dig into it, oops, I clicked the wrong button. Uh, you can go to phoenixframework.org and that has all the details on Phoenix, including about Phoenix channels. So let's make a to-do element. Um, so I'm going to start with seeing if I can live code this thing. Um, but fear not if I get myself completely uh, messed up, uh, I have a working example on another branch. Um, so let's see. Oh, 
that's what a channel looks like <laughs> as it turns out i'll walk through what that code does in a minute um but where i want to be is here so what i'm going to start with is a uh basically default um example project created by a tool called Byte. Um, if you haven't seen Byte, uh, it's really, really great. Um, it's kind of like a more generic um, Create React app, um, for lack of a better description. Um, it's um, kind of a, a very lightweight build tool for JavaScript as well. Um, and it lets lets you really easy easily create um, new JavaScript projects. Um, in our case, we're doing TypeScript, but new TypeScript projects that will then assemble them for you into an NPM. Um, and it's kind of trying to um, rather than like doing the whole transpilation thing, it's trying to, to really let the browser uh, to leverage the what's in the browser as much as possible. So. Nowadays, for example, browsers can deal with JavaScript modules directly. They can speak pretty modern forms of JavaScript. Um, we really don't need to do as much transpilation as we used to do. And Vite kind of embraces that approach. Um, so uh, this is not a talk on Vite, but I will say Vite is pretty cool. Um, and that's what I used to, to create kind of the base structure that we have here. Um, so I basically followed the instructions for creating a, I think it was the lit element and TypeScript. Um, and what it gives you out of the box is just a almost empty HTML page with a single custom element in it. And uh, we're going to take that and change it to be what we want. Um, so this is what it generates, um, and we're using a library called lit element, um, which makes custom elements, uh, a little nicer to build. The main thing lit element does is anytime your properties change, it will trigger a re-render. Uh, and so what we're making here is a, a to-do list, of course because that's what you do. So we'll call our elements to-do list. And we'll make um, we'll make our to-dos property be a <coughs> excuse me an array of strings so our to do's are just strings and because we're typescript and i don't want to declare one i guess i probably could have but oh well that's fine i'm just going to say it can optionally be undefined and then what i'm going to do uh, in my render function and this is what will actually appear inside of um, my custom element. And we'll keep that div. And I'll say, this is my to-do list. And then I will render my to-dos by just mapping over them. And I'm putting an LI out for each. And let's see, that's like, we don't need all this stuff that it gives us as an example, but I will 
change this to be to do list. Oh, and we should give our class a better name if we didn't already. Did I do that? Oh, no. To do list element. To do list element. All right. And then the last thing we need to do. Oh, did I not change the name of the file? I'm going to change the name of the file too. So this is just standard creating a custom element stuff so far. We've not done any live state yet. We've got everything right. I feel all right. And hopefully, if I've gotten everything right, that should be enough for my to do uh, list element to actually function. So we'll start up our server. Byte gives us a little tiny server to render. And sure enough, we have a, this is my to do list, and there's nothing in it because we have no elements yet. So, um, that's just making sure that our custom element is wired up and we see that it is. What we want to do now is connect our um, custom element to a live state instance. Um, the other thing that I just realized that I forgot to do and is important, we also want to have a, uh, an input for typing in a new to-do I'm gonna do it on time, 12.41. So I guess I'm okay. And then last but not least, we want a button to add to you. And then we'll wire up our button, which means we need a add to do function that will get a, an event which i'm not going to care about uh, i do however want a convenient way to get to that input so that i can create my to do so there's a really oh, oh not that one there's a really nice um, annotation or decorator that um, lit element gives me that will make it easier to um, to access um, elements using a CSS selector. So this takes a CSS selector. I can do input name equals to do. And then that will be my to do input. The untype HTML input. All right. And I'm doing that so that in here I can dispatch new custom events called add to do and that will take a detail with to do this dot to do input dot value. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna get that question. Um, yeah, at this point it will definitely be there. So what this will 
Where do I that? So um, what I'm doing here is I'm dispatching a new custom event called add to do with a payload that contains whatever I typed into that text field. Let's just check that out. And then, you know what, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clear it just so that it will be easier to add more than one. All right, so at this point in time, should be able to type, hey there, and nothing happens, but my form is cleared. So that's what I've dispatched, uh, that's what I expect. And I'm just checking to make sure I don't have any errors. So at this point, I'm dispatching an event, but nobody's listening. So nothing happens yet, but I should have everything I need actually in place. And now I'm going to actually wire up my live state instance. So um, on the server side, I already have my server set up and running. And um, I'm just going to make a connection to it. I'm going to do that by overriding a connected callback function. And this is part of the life cycle for custom elements. It's a function that's going to get called anytime my element is connected to the DOM. And uh, I do need to call super because a uh, lit element is doing some stuff and I need to make sure that stuff still happens. Um, but what I'm going to do now is actually set up a live state instance. So I'm going to make a property for it first. And now I'm going to create it. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to connect to my local environment, which is on localhost 4000. And the web socket URL there is just slash socket. And the channel should be to do's with any prefix. In this case, I'm just calling it to do's colon all. And that should define my connection to live view. At this point, I should see that it's probably already reloaded and I can see that eh, maybe not. Let's try it again. All righty. Oh, <laughs> it would help if I saved because that would trigger recompile and all that goodness. Now the question is, should that have worked? I think it should have. Oh, I didn't tell it to connect. Never mind. I do need to do the next thing, which is call connect. Connect element. So connect element gets. Uh, oh, looks like it gets live state first. Oops, I got to go fix my slides. That's why you practice your talk. And then finally, this options object where I tell it what properties and what events I am concerned about. In this case, I have one property, which is my to-dos. And I have one event that I want to send, which is my add to do event. And that should actually fully connect up. And we can see I'm getting an error back from Phoenix on match topic. Okay. 
So let's look at our server real quick and we'll see what I have done wrong. Um, so this is Elixir code and um, this is defining our channel and believe it or not, this is the entire code for this guy. So there's not much going on here. All he basically decide, sets up um, is um, he gets a chance to define an initial state, which I'm basically saying, like, when you first connect, set up the state with a to-dos property and an empty list. When you receive a handle event, I I'm sorry, when you receive an add to-do event, this handle event function will get called and it will destructure that event payload, pull out the to do. It will have the to do's list uh, already on the state. And it will basically just return a new state that is the existing list with that to do added to it. Um, but what it's complaining about is I obviously messed up the topic name and oops, it's an S. Uh, anytime you make a typo, it's probably one character and it's probably an S. That's what I've learned in my many years of software development. You're welcome. Sure enough, now I'm connecting and it's saying, hey, there's an empty list of to-dos. So now let's see. Talk at CNCJS add to-do. Boop. Show off live state. Impress the people's profit. That seems unlikely, but okay. So what's happening? Um, we are each time I fill in a new to do, I am dispatching that event because live state is configured to send the add to do event when this add to do event is dispatched it will send that up to the server sending it up to the server means it will actually um, because we told it the server's here. This is the address of the, the server itself. This is the channel to connect to. What that matches here in our socket configuration. Sorry, I'm not going to try to like to try to explain all the Phoenix <laughs> as well as talking about live state would just be too much. But um, suffice to say, this is where we're defining our channel in Elixir. And this channel name says, to do colon star, anything that starts with to do, here's the channel handler. And that channel handler, this is the live state part. Uh, this is the server side library for live state. When we say use live state dot channel, that's what we're saying. And uh, that consists of a set of functions that we get to implement over in Elixir. And like I said, we only have two here an init function that defines our initial state of an empty list. So that means if I reconnect, that list will go away. I'm not saving it or anything. And then the event handler and that add to do, that's, that's basically has to match the name of our custom event. Our detail property is just turned into this and that lets us pull out our to do. And finally, the third argument is the current state we said initially is the empty state or the an empty list, excuse me, which means that when we return a new state, we just return it with the to do's property set to existing list, whatever it is, plus the new to do. And that's why each time we call it, it's just going to build that list. Um, just, uh, nothing up my sleeve. If I reload, Hey, where did um, our list go? We can add to it again. 
So um, this is like the basic hello world of live state client and server. Um, let me look in the chat and see if we have oh, Brian Bolte. That Brian Bolte guy again. Do we have any questions on this so far? Um, I have another kind of more, more sophisticated example to show as well, but I'll just stop for a pause and see uh, if anybody had any questions so far. Chris, you know, go ahead. Thought I heard somebody say something. Someone asked, can they use a channel for many elements? Uh, you can. Um, I do have an example of that. Um, and let's see, can we just, yeah, that might be interesting to see. Um, I do have an example of doing that. So I was gonna show you one example and I probably will, but I'll go to, um, I'll go to the multi-element example first. And uh, the multi-element example is uh, my little, uh, I call it live state commerce. Uh, and it's just basically a, uh, a little pretend okay. e-commerce example using hey, Chris, it's state. probably also worth also doing worth a time check. We have five minutes to one o'clock and I don't know exactly if you had a hard cutoff time you're planning to go into. But I don't. Um, I'll keep talking if people can hang on, but I'll try to get to this example real quick if I can. Um, I just don't want anyone to miss their one o'clock meetings or anything. Gotcha. Um, so if I jump over here, let me get chat window and show my to do. Oh, no, what did I call it? Live state commerce. Let's see the front end of this guy. And um, the live state commerce example, um, this is basically showing off um, a list of products. Uh, each have their own buy button. And what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of making a pretend buy button that has a SKU property. And then elsewhere on the page, I have a cart which displays the user's cart. So um, the cart and all the state for that cart, that's managed by live state. So here's an example of multiple uh, different elements connected up to the same uh, live state instance and channel. And um, I need to start up the server side of that. So let me do that real quick. Hopefully, hopefully everything's in a good working state. Looks like it is. Oh yeah, it's complaining that the Front end is still trying to talk to it, but it doesn't know about that channel. Okay. All right. So this is our live state commerce example. And what we can see here is if we use our buy button, we see our cart is immediately updated and we can put multiple elements in our cart. So how does all that work? Um, the answer is pretty much the same way as the other example we saw. Uh, the difference here is that uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to use the same live state instance for both elements. And I'm sure there's more than one way to do that. I'm taking a very simplistic approach, which is basically saying, um, the element that gets initialized first, see if there's a live state property on the window. If there isn't, make one. And that's connecting to a channel cart colon new. 
In this case, this is the buy button. The buy button doesn't have any state. He's just a buy button. He's dumb. And all he's going to do is send a single add cart item event. If we look at, uh, and he's just a button bound to a buy function when you click. That buy function is trivial. It just emits a add cart item custom event with the detail property that has a SKU in it. Our live commerce cart. He's kind of like the mirror opposite. He's doing that same connection. So in that example we saw, we actually have three different custom elements all connected up to the same live state. Um, what he's doing is he's basically saying the cart property is managed by live state. He doesn't have any events right now. Now, if this was a real example, you'd probably be able to remove stuff from your cart and stuff. But in this case, I'm not doing that yet. I'm just displaying the cart. So all he does is loop over the cart items and render them. Nothing to it. So on the server side, and obviously feel free to jump in with questions. Oh yeah, that's my, that's the server running, but let me actually show you the code. This is the cart channel. Um, he's actually surprisingly simple. I've forgotten how little there is going on here. Um, this actually does persist to the cart, <laughs> but <laughs> It well doesn't yeah. So it's actually persisting a cart, but it's making a new one each time. So that's silly, obviously. So in your, any kind of real world scenario, what you would do here when you created the cart, you would save off its ID, uh, probably in local storage, so that when you connected, you could retrieve that same cart. So that would be a relatively simple thing to add to this example, and I probably will before I give this talk again. Um, but in this case, it's doing the dumb thing and just creating a new cart in the database anytime you make a connection. Um, the entire state is just that cart. And then the event that we handle called add, kite art, uh, add cart item gets the payload that just has that SKU property. It gets the current cart from the state. And that calls a function uh, that's in our backend um, Phoenix context. I'm not going to go in to add item to cart, but basically it's just looking up a product by its SKU and adding a cart item that's associated with this cart. Uh, it's also smart enough to go like, is there already a item for the SKU? If so, bump its quantity. Um, so all that logic lives over the Elixir code. And that's just plain old Elixir. There's nothing to do with live state here. Uh, all it's basically saying is when you call add item to cart, you get back a new cart with the new item or the new quantity. And then you basically just set that on the state, uh, which causes that um, behind the scenes, there's an event called state change which is what actually is listened to by live state and then triggers the re-render of the cart. So um, that's, I jumped straight to the, you know, I started with a very simple example and then this is like over on the more complex side. So um, is there anything that I can, I can explain better that, that I went too fast on? <laughs> Is there a way to use channels in React? Not yet. Uh, well, you could use it. channels itself is just JavaScript. And um, in fact, live state is completely usable in React. 
what I don't have and probably wouldn't be very difficult to write. Um, the only thing that I don't have is connect element for React. I don't think that would be very hard to write. Um, not a huge React fan, but it would probably be worth doing, even though I'm not. Honestly, what you would probably want is a use live state hook, which I think would be very doable. Um, I just I haven't gotten to that yet. Um, I'm I'm kind of approaching this from the standpoint of um, building kind of embedded apps, and I feel like custom elements are a really good tool for that. And React is maybe not as much, but that said, yeah, it's it's definitely occurred to me that there's no reason why the same approach couldn't manage a React component, and. Uh, yeah, that could be done. But really, custom elements are better. You should use them. Forget about React. You with me, Brian? No. Oh. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, we'll post to the Cincinnati JS uh, meetup when we uh, post the video. I, I don't see any reason why not. And yeah, great question. Wow, you're just all about the great questions. Um, yes, all this code is available um, and github.com slash launch scout is us. And so uh, live underscore state well, let's look at the JavaScript first. This is since JS. Live state. Come on, what are you doing? Yeah, live dash state is um, the repo for the NPM package. Live underscore state is the repo for uh, the channel, uh, the Elixir library. And then there, um, uh, there's a more um sophisticated example which i didn't have it well more it, different uh, maybe a more mature example that i have in live state comments um and the repo for the server and the client side of that is there uh it's also worth pointing out uh if you go to the launch scouts ah, launch .com slash blog Oh, watch, watch scout. We need to reserve that domain name, Peter, in case somebody typos there. I think I actually have it. I just need to set up the mapping. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so if we go to our blog, um, I have a post uh, that goes through all of kind of how to work with um, live state, um, but. For the example here, I'm building a custom comments element. And then down at the bottom, this is actually that comments element um, for you know actually working. Um, and so this is more of an example of, here's how you do this in the real world. If you look at the HTML here, let's just do that real quick. Um, that live state comments element that's connecting to an external server deployed on Heroku. And that's where all the data for that lives. Uh, and it's actually connecting to a live state instance. And the other thing that it's doing is this is actually using a pub sum under the covers. So if somebody gets on here and adds a comment, this should actually live update in real time uh, because it's just getting that state over WebSockets and it's, uh, using pub sub to see other people's comments get added. All right, so I'm a little over time. Uh, with IoT, um, not any, <laughs> I don't know, common and it's, it's not you, yeah. I don't, so there's a whole Elixir library called Nerves, which is used in IoT stuff uh, and it's great. Uh, most of what I'm doing is web stuff, so um, the overlap with IoT is probably pretty small.
anybody else have questions? All right, I'm gonna stop my share. I'm gonna stop my recording.